Okay, thanks Deepa for um, setting up this session today. It was due to occur on June 5th, but it's now July 24. Um, and author biological perspective, a seminar on open forum with myself, Shane Powell and John McPhee. And Yeah, so basically we'll be doing three short introductory seminars. Myself, a general seminar on soil health. Shane will look at specific microbial communities and John will look at an example of controlled traffic and arthropods. The focus of today's open forum is really to encourage collaboration and discussion um, around the ideas of, of soil health. I guess from my perspective, I've been involved in soil health projects for the last three to five years. Um, some of them state government funded, some of them um, hort innovation funded through the potato industry and the vegetable sector. Um, so I guess I've appreciated and enjoyed working in that area over the last five years. Um, so an outline of my talk today is I'm going to talk about the components of soil health or soil ecosystems, I'm going to define what healthy soils are, what are some of the challenges in maintaining soil health, um, some basic strategies for improving soil health, and some of the ways that we might actually measure soil health. Um, so soil, I guess, is quite a complex system, but we can break it into three major components, the physical structure, the chemical constituents and the biological communities. Um, and changes in these properties and functions are critical to sustainability and cropping success. Some of the changes can occur in the short term. For instance, if we add lime to the soil, um, we'll get a quick and sudden alteration in pH. Some of the other changes are very much long term. So if we're looking to build soil structure or improve soil carbon levels, um, that might take three or four years to occur. So some changes can be very short, others can be long, longer term changes in the soil system. In terms of a healthy soil, how do we define it? I guess if you ask 10 diff different people that question, you'll probably get 10 different answers. But the definition that I like to use is one that's been provided by Bob Larkin, who's a US researcher who came and visited TR about two or three years ago, two or three years ago. And I guess he provided a practical definition of what a healthy soil is. Essentially, it has high levels of organic matter, friable structure, high water holding capacity and drainage, adequate nutrients and balanced nutrient cycling, sufficient depth for root growth, large and diverse populations of soil biota, low populations of pathogens, resistance to degradation and resilience to stress. I guess there can be some challenges in maintaining all these features within a healthy soil. And that's because within some of our cropping systems, some of them are fairly high input systems and they're pretty demanding on the soil. Specifically, some of our high intensity crops like potato and carrot, where we have a lot of bed formation, um, tillage, they're also high input systems requiring a lot of fertilizer, irrigation, and also pesticides. Associated with that, we have a lot of traffic going over our soils a lot of the times, and that can lead to compaction and also structure decline. Uh, we need to note that we have different setups and different production systems that we work across within TR and they have different levels of intensity of management, um, ranging from vegetable systems, which have a high intensity of management, um, down to perennial tree crops, which have a less intensity system of management. But soil health is highly applicable and irrelevant and relevant across all of those different systems within TR. I guess if we look at an extreme example of why soil health is important and what can happen if we don't look after soil health, here we've got an example, an extreme example of soil degradation occurring. This shows a carrot crop 
at Forthside uh, one and a half years ago um, during the carrot crop. Uh, we, we made measures of physical soil health. So we made an aggregate stability measure, um, looked at the proportion of aggregates greater than two mil. So that's fractions that are in the stable aggregates. Um, during the carrot crop, these were 40%, but after a wet, late carrot harvest where we had a lot of um, damage occurring, you can see from the soil there, we've got a lot of compaction, cracking, slaking of soil, we see a reduction from 40% down to 25%. So we see reduction in soil structure occurring. And that's an extreme example of what can happen when perhaps we don't manage our soils that well. Um, I guess from an environmental perspective, we also need to, to look after our soils. And this is an image of what happens after heavy rainfall. Um, happened a, a few years ago on the northwest coast when we had a heavy rainfall event and we lost a lot of our topsoils going out into Bass Strait. Um, so I guess it's showing us from an environmental perspective it's important to actually look after our soils. So if we move on now and look at some basic practices that do promote healthy soil, um, the addition of organic matter is one of those practices that does promote healthy soil. And most cases that's via the use of cover cropping and that's the use of a non-cash crop grown as an alternative to fallow. So um, we cover the soil surface with a crop to protect um, that soil from wind and water erosion. We can also add um, organic matter by adding manure and compost amendments as another strategy as well. Um, reducing tillage is also an important component. Um, keeping off wet soils um, also helps protect our soils. Th there's other strategies available to promote healthy soil. That's just a couple of them that I've provided. And that I guess leads into to one of our trials that we've conducted at Forsyth over the last um, three to five years, where we've looked at a, a setup comparing um, the use of cover crops with a fallow, a traditional bare fallow system, and trying to look at what some of the benefits um, from utilising cover crops might be. So here we're using a ryegrass grown in winter or a biofumigate, in this case it's caliente, and comparing it um, with a fallow or bare ground treatment, which might be your control treatment. And I guess, simply speaking, some really quick results from that is that from the grass and caliente treatment, we're seeing the addition of organic matter to the soil results in greater productivity um, within that carrot crop. Um, associated with that, we also see higher levels of organic carbon and also a greater fraction of aggregates in the stable aggregate. So it's providing some benefits to the soil in terms of carbon and aggregate stability. Um, and Shane will look at this in some more detail in her talk when she talks about some of the biological parameters from that. Finally, I just want to talk about how we might measure soil health because I guess this is a research area in itself. Um, traditionally, a lot of farmers will measure chemical properties and that might be the only measure they utilise, um, but physical and biological properties are also highly important as well. Um, so traditionally, this might be a chemical test that we that we might do and a farmer might get. Um, and this is largely for, for deciding what type of fertilisers they might put on. But it does contain surrogate measures of soil health. Um, for instance, it contains levels of carbon, um, which is a good indication as to how our soils are tracking. Other measures that we might look at, physical components, we can look at aggregate stabilities, which give an idea of the ability of the soil to, to cope with stresses, whether that's rainfall, um, wind erosion and that type of thing. Other tests, we might look at infiltration tests and penetrometer tests. So there's quite a lot of physical tests available that we can utilise. I guess 
one of the big unknowns in the area that I'm particularly wanting to focus on is some of the biological soil properties. And these are kind of evolving areas and tests have been evolving in these areas for the last, I guess, 10 to 20 years. So they're newer tests and we still have tests evolving in these specific areas. And we might measure things like enzyme activity, um, what communities are present, what pathogens are present, and also what type of beneficials are present. And there's a high degree, degree of diversity um, within the biological spectrum. From my perspective, I'm kind of work a fair bit in the potato area. So I tend to focus on what might be the key soil-borne pathogens. And as an example of that, I might look at a, a pathogen that causes powdery scab. So it's a single pathogen test might measure levels of Spongospora subterranea across the bottom axis there. And at certain levels, particularly above 1000 picograms of our pathogen, we're likely to um, get our disease powdery scab that we can see on the right hand side there. So that kind of creates a risk threshold and we can tell growers whether they should be planting in, in those specific soils. Um, if we go back to that, that pathogen is only just one small component within this spectrum. Um, and from my perspective, um, that pathogen can cause a lot of problems, but trying to control those, those problems and control those diseases, we haven't currently got a solution to those things. We can alter soil pH, alter chemistry. We haven't found solutions to those problems kind of believe that some of the solutions to these problems may actually sit within the biological sphere, the identification of beneficials, the identification of um, suppressive organisms. So there's a whole lot of unknowns that sit within this slide. Um, so there's the opportunity for a fair bit of research gain. Um, from a cover crop perspective, which I showed you perspective before, we've measured physical parameters and chemical parameters, um, but perhaps the greatest interest is in some of the biological parameters that have come out of these. So when we do a field day, things like that, most of the questions that come back relate to how does the biology change? What's happening to the biology on the site when we utilize a cover crop? So with that, we can look at soil communities and different communities that might give us an indication as to how the soil is tracking and how, is it, how, it's, how it's performing. So this is kind of where I um, hand over to Shane, who's gonna look at, in a little bit more detail at how these soil communities may track and change under different cover crop treatments. So I'll finish that there. Um, Excellent. Thank you, Robert. Hopefully uh, my screen has now popped up. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about the soil microbiome in terms of um, the fourth side, um, the fourth side trial that Robert was talking about. So this project has been going for quite a while and there's uh, a reasonable list of contributors. We have um, couple of students working on some of the data from this. Now, why is my, sorry, I'm struggling to look at the camera and my, my slides at the same time. So Robert talked a little bit about what soil health might be or how you might define it. Um, and then he said, you know, we've got this staggering biodiversity of organisms in the soil. So what would a healthy soil microbiome be? Um, and microbiome just simply refers to all the small organisms that are living in the soil. I think one way of thinking of it is a collection of organisms that are conducive to plant health, because when we're talking about uh, cropping systems, that's, that's what we want. We want plants that grow well. A healthy soil microbiomes are important because they provide a range of what's often called ecosystem services. So those that covers everything from degradation of organic matter and recycling of nutrients to providing some of the um, disease suppressive 
um, characteristics of, of some soils or competing with pathogens and, and controlling their numbers. So as well as the traditional sort of biological control. The thing about a healthy soil microbiome is that it's likely to have different forms under different conditions. So it's not as though we can say, this here is what a healthy soil biological community looks like. This is what you need to aim at to have a healthy soil microbiome. I think it's becoming clearer that under different conditions you have different organisms, which kind of makes sense. So therefore what is good and healthy and conducive to plant growth might be different in, in different conditions as well. Um, so this was the just the same photo you've already seen of fourth side. So I'll um, skip through this pretty quickly. There's been annual sampling at this site every year. And for the last few, four, four years, um, the samplings included taking samples for analysis of the microbiome through looking at DNA markers. Sam these samples are taken in June, so two to three weeks prior to the planting of the cover crop. That's kind of important. I'll come back to that point later. At the same time, soils are collected for nutrient analysis. Um, during the time you've also looked at disease potential, disease incidence, vegetable production. So when we finally manage to put all of this data together, it's going to be a really very thorough picture of what happens uh, in the soil and in a cropping system when cover crops are present, different types of, of cover crops. For the biological communities, we've been collecting four samples per plot in soil cores, extracting the DNA using a power soil kit. So this is fairly standard. Um, and then doing high throughput amplicon sequencing on the MySeq platform for people that want a little bit of technical detail. And we've been looking at three, essentially three different communities. So we've been looking at the bacteria, we've been looking at the fungi, and we've also been looking at the microbial um, eukaryotes. So we pick up a range of organisms in that assay, everything from soil algae to nematodes to diatoms, uh, protozoa, protists, and amoeba, and some a lot of things that I still can't pronounce their names very well. Now, the first thing that we've noticed is that cultivating the soil causes change. Um, and, you know, I'm sure people are kind of rolling their eyes and going, yeah, well, of course it does. Um, but it was at least for me, quite startling how obvious this was in the biological communities when we looked at this data. So these sort of plots that we've got here, and this first one is the UK, shows the data from the eukaryote communities. In these plots where points are clustered closely together in a group, that means they're quite similar to each other and points that are further apart are more different. Each one of those points represents one entire community. So it represents um, tens of thousands of sequences and certainly hundreds to thousands of different organisms. So there's quite complex data, which is why we try and find a way of presenting it visually. So if you can just think each one of these points is an entire community. These four up here all came from a control. Uh, it was, I, it was a control that wasn't entirely planned for. Um, samples were just collected of permanent pasture just outside of the, the main paddock. Put, we put them in the analysis alongside the samples that were taken from the, the fallow and the biofumigant plots and the ryegrass plots. And the things that were the most different were these control uh, samples that have, have never been cultivated in any way. And that was the same also for the bacterial communities and the fungal communities. So the things that are the most, the communities are the biological organisms that are the most different to anything else are the ones that have never had any, um, any addition of fertilizer, any cultivation, any tillage. Um, they've just been totally left alone. So that, that kind of makes sense. And it also makes sense when we look at the other properties of the soil. Uh, and we can see along here the control in the top line is more organic matter, 
high carbon, um, the potassium and phosphate, the phosphorus is much lower, no fertilizers being applied. So the actual characteristics of that soil are quite different as well. So that now we're starting to see, well, what lives in the soil is really closely connected to the characteristics of the soil. So then I said, okay, well, that's, that's nice that these control samples are different to everything else. But what we really want to know is what effect have the cover crops had on the communities compared to the fallow? Uh, and the first look at the data looked like this, and it was a little bit surprising because at first glance, it seems like as though there's uh, nothing going on here that the, the crops have had absolutely no, no effect on the communities whatsoever. This is the same plot as the one I just had, but now we've had a look at uh, where exactly in the paddock the samples were taken from. And there's a really clear division between the north side and the south side of the paddock. The communities found in those two places are quite different and it's, it's consistent. It was also consistent in the fungal and the eukaryote communities. Uh, and when, when I do a statistical test on it, uh, the R value, so the strength of the different separation between the two groups is quite high and the significance is uh, quite low. So significance of 0 0.1 is a p-value of 0 0.001. So I went back and had a look at this and went, it, is it something that we did in the analysis? Did I extract the DNA on two different days? Is there something um, that, that we've some kind of bias that we've put in there? And it actually, it wasn't. But what it is, is in this slide here, I've gone back and looked at all the nutrient um, analysis that was done and plotted that. And again, we see that the north side of the paddock is actually different to the south side of the paddock. Um, so I've put the, the reason it's alphabetical is A, B, C, D, E, F on this side down here uh, are different to the EFGHIJKL. So again, what this is telling us is that the biological communities and the structure of the communities, the different organisms that are present um, in different amounts is more related to the soil characteristics than anything else. And when I, when I had a look at what and ran some other correlation analyses, uh, they were most closely related to variation in the total nitrogen and the pH of the soil. And I've got pH, the water extract here, but it was the same for the calcium chloride extract as well. So taking that into consideration that we have these two, in this one paddock, we have these two blocks that are different. I then went back and asked the data, is there an effect of the cover crops? And there, there was. So overall, um, when you take that sort of blocking effect into account, there is a significant difference between the treatments, but it's much smaller than the effect of the different characteristics of the soil. Um, so overall, it, you know, 0 0.48. So when we looked at that first one, the effect of the, the north-south divide 0 0.9, sorry, that was the cultivated, uncultivated, the strength of that was 0 0.9. The effect of the north-south difference in the soil characteristics is down to 0 0.48. And then the effect of the different treatments, um, the strength of that is down around um, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. They're all significant. Um, statistically speaking, but the actual size of that difference has changed. And this again was true for the bacterial, the eukaryote and the fungal communities. And I'm only uh, showing the bacterial communities here today because I'm trying to get through this in eight minutes. So, so far what we've seen with this kind of first look at the data, and this is just one year's worth of data, is that there are differences in the biological communities in the soil with different cover crops. It's quite subtle. Um, so it's not that when one particular cover crop is present, we get you know, several groups appear that weren't there before, or that um, when you use a biofumigant, particular groups disappear completely. 
it's more that the balance um, has changed between them, the relative abundance between different groups has changed. This is good because it suggests that the functional redundancy in the system is preserved so that all those ecosystem services we were talking about before are still present in each of those treatments um, because we've still got this diversity uh, and, but we're just looking at, at subtle changes in the community structure. The other thing to remember is the point I made at the beginning about the timing of the sampling, which was two to three weeks before the cover crop was planted. So that means the samples were taken at the point in the year that was the furthest away from when the co those cover crops were actually in the ground. And in between the cover crop being in the ground and the samples being taken, all treatments have had a vegetable crop in there that has been the same. So although there is an effect of the plants, and it, I think it's actually a lot more significant that there is a change or a, a difference where the different cover crops have been because there have been all these other effects in the intervening time. The differences that we can see in this system in the biological communities is mostly related to soil characteristics. And so if the cover crops are indeed increasing the organic matter or increasing different um, things about the structure of the soil, that then has an effect on the biological community. So it's, it is all really connected. Um, and the, the other thing that I don't have time to talk about today, but some of you might have seen another talk that we did in a cover crop project that was looking at different sites across Australia, is that different soils respond differently. So the changes that we saw between fallow and cover crop sites were different uh, at fourth site to what they were at our second Tasmanian site, to what they were in Cowra and in Gatton in Queensland. So we've, we've got lots of things to think about when you are talking about the microbiome and um, what it's doing because it's responding to soil characteristics. They're different in different systems and you're talking about changes in, in different cropping systems as well. So it's, it's a really complex, um, complex story to be trying to unravel. So the other, some of the other things we want to look at more deeply in this data are the functional changes in the communities. What are they actually doing? What occurs during the growth and incorporation of the cover crops? And we have a PhD student, Brianna, who's spending a lot of time looking at this at the moment. Are there differences between the rhizosphere and the bulk soil, which would kind of make sense? Are there any general trends? So despite the fact that different soils respond differently, can we find some general trends? So we have, we have all the data here now, um, but it's going to take a little bit of time to wade, wade through it and pull all the information out that we need for that. Thank you to a whole lot of people that have been involved in this. I'm a little bit of a latecomer to the trial, um, but it's, it's been really interesting. It's been really great uh, working across centres as well. So I might stop there and um, hand on to John to talk about a different part of the biological communities. Thanks, John, you should be able to load up now. So just following on from Shane, this, this bit of work I'm gonna talk about dates back a few years now. Um, it certainly predates the, the more recent interest in lots of cover crops and multi-species cover crops and all those sorts of things. <clears throat> um, but one of the things that Shane mentioned was the influence of cultivation on, on the communities in the, uh, in the work at Forsyth. The work I'm going to speak about was done at Forsyth, but we only looked at one uh, community, if you like, the soil arthropods. And one of the things that causes a great deal of disruption in uh, factors that affect soil health is this thing here. And um, it, is, it is the tire and the load that leads to a lot of the tillage that happens in, um, well, in any cultivation system, but in vegetable production in particular. So the work that we were doing at the time was looking at uh, control traffic production in um, uh, control traffic system rather than vegetable production. And um, what we see here is a fairly typical um, potato harvest operation, which when it's finished leaves the soil looking something like that. And 
in the work that we were doing under controlled traffic, we used some different technology, different harvest technology that at the end of harvest leaves the soil looking something like that. So we have our wheel tracks confined to either side of this zone here, which is highly disturbed, but not run over by, by wheels. Um, as the title said, we're looking at soil arthropods in under a controlled traffic vegetable production system. You might ask why arthropods, given that there are so many millions of, of organisms in the soil. Um, partly it was driven by a colleague who was working here at the time, Dennis Rogers, for those who know him, um, the only person I've ever known who's totally in love with arth arthropods. Um, it's his absolute professional passion. Um, but there is another aspect to it in that soil arthropods are not capable of burrowing in their own habitat. They're not burrowers. They have they opportunistically use the voids in the soil that are available to them. And so to some extent, soil arthropods can be considered as a sort of a surrogate measure for soil structure and porosity. So what we were interested in here was to see do we actually see a difference in the soil arthropod population between soil that's been heavily trafficked and soil that, that hasn't been? So the crop sequence that we looked at uh, in this particular work started with potatoes, and that's what those previous photos were. Um, went through that sort of crop rotation. There were some cover crops interspersed um, in between the, uh, the cash crops. And the sampling that was related, that I'm going to talk about the results, uh, were taken at these two points in a broccoli, a winter broccoli crop and a spring carrot crop about 15 months apart. And I think there's one important thing to remember before we go on and look at some data, is that the soil in both of these areas was, was cultivated. Like we, we had quite uh, conventional cultivation operations in both the, the conventional traffic area and the controlled traffic area. The main difference in cultivation would have been in intensity. We had about a 70% reduction in the number of cultivation operations over the course of the, of the work, the three and a half years that the work went on, about a 70% reduction in the controlled traffic area. But having said that, any cultivation operation is you know, fairly disturbing to the soil. So what we're really looking at here, I think in the results, which I'll come to in a moment, is actually the absence of traffic. So if we look at arthropod abundance, so this is just purely the, the, the raw count of the number of arthropods that were collected in samples. Now the samples were taken at three depths at the surface, zero to 50 mil, uh, 70 to 120 mil, and 140 to 190 mil depths. And they were taken in a core that was approximately 200 uh, cubic centimetres in volume. <clears throat> so what we're looking at here is about a threefold difference in the number of arthropods in the spring sampling between controlled traffic and random traffic or conventional traffic, whichever you want to think of it as. And in the winter time, roughly a doubling of, of difference uh, in, in sheer number of organisms. If we look at that over a, um, a depth profile, once again, the, the pretty obvious thing here is the very high number in the surface under the spring controlled traffic area. But what I think is probably even is more interesting is that at depth, we have similar numbers in the control traffic as we have at the surface in the random traffic, um, particularly in the spring, uh, but also in the in the sort of winter uh, winter sampling. I've got to remember that these, these arthropods are not, like they don't go deep in the soil. Um, Dennis was surprised to find many at the sort of depth that we're talking about here. We also looked at arthropod diversity. So that's basically the number of different species that are present. And we see here that once again, in the controlled traffic, we've got a fairly substantial percentage increase at least in terms of um, the number of different 
uh, arthropods that are present in the control traffic. Not such a big deal in the in the winter sampling, but once again we see yeah no great difference in the first couple of depths, um, and again in the control traffic at depth we've got just as much diversity as we have at the surface in the uh, in the random traffic area. So I guess what this is saying is that sure there's a lot of there's a lot of disruption that happens to soil um, but in the context of this particular piece of work there was disruption from tillage across all of it and disruption from traffic only in part of it and it's showing a, a very clear influence of the of the um, of the traffic. I'm going to finish off with one other slide, which is nothing at all to do with anything that we've done here. Completely different environment, completely different organisms are interested in, completely different cropping system, completely different soil. The only only possible comparison you might make is that it was about the influence of traffic and tillage on earthworm population. And um, once again, we see this massive increase when we take, or in this case, taking both cultivation and traffic out of the equation. Um, and there's clearly some synergistic effect here because we get a, an increase when, when the wheels are taken off, we get an increase when the tillage is taken out, but we get a massive increase when both of them are taken out. So I'm just going to finish it there because it's well time we got on to the discussion, I guess. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand back to Robert. You can take it on.